when you go to a restaurant the first thing you see is the front you don't see the food that they cook in the kitchen you got to get the people to walk through the door first before you can even tell them what you're selling them so it's the same thing with youtube like the person has to be locked in from the thumbnail like i remember mr b said you got to have it to where somebody falling asleep about to go to bed is like nah i gotta click this thumbnail before i fall asleep like it has to be a burning desire to click it i have this crazy goal right now which is in the next three months so the next 90 days I want this channel to hit 100,000 subscribers. Insane. Here's how you guys can help me. Right now, 96.9% .9 of people that watch the podcast are not subscribed. If you've enjoyed this podcast, if you've gotten even one nugget of information, inspiration from this podcast, please subscribe. Help me reach my goal. 18, 19 years old. I'm sitting there working at Macy's, staring at the register, Dude. trading time for money. Yeah. Earning six to seven bucks an hour. Yeah. At this point now, right? You've been doing YouTube for like over a decade. Yeah. You've made over $5 million just on AdSense. Mm -hmm. But I want to go back to the 18, 19 year old. Yeah. So give me the context. Give me the beginning. How did this YouTube journey start? Man, so I really just had a passion for fashion, uh, specifically with the sneaker game. Um, and then just a passion for gaming. Like I just love playing video games, right? And so that's really how it started. It was just me figuring out how I can monetize my hobby. Um, and when I was working at Macy's, it was like, it was just super prevalent to me that I had to do it. Cause I was still, you know, trying to go to college. I was at a two year, um, trying to like figure it out, trying to figure out what I wanted to be. Cause my dad's like an accountant, uh, finance and CPA, got a master's degree. And I was trying to kind of follow his footsteps, but I just kind of figured it wasn't for me. Um, and so at Macy's, it was kind of just like, okay, well, if school's not gonna be what it is, and this is clearly not gonna be what it is, what are you, what are you gonna do to like get out of here? And I got inspired by watching a bunch of YouTubers that were already like, you know, doing it, like buying their dream cars, buying their dream cribs, right? And so I just said like, man, like I'm just as good as them at these games, just as good as them with these sneakers. Like how can I like make some money off of this, right? And so, the biggest thing for me was when I started, it was always about me um, and like what I was into. So I started with the sneakers and I learned really, really quickly that, you know, if I want to be this, you know, superstar YouTuber and make a lot of money, I can't invest money into a new Jordan drop every time it comes out. Cause every time it comes out, I'm going to have to spend my YouTube check on a shoe. And I just didn't see it as being scalable. Like, you know, how long is the sneaker community going to be like this popular, and I'm talking about times where like Kai Somar, um, you know, sneaker, uh, sneakerhead in the Bay, like all these sneakerhead YouTubers are just going crazy. And I just saw the wave, like not being something I could do forever. And so then I said, you know what? I don't want to show like, you know, my face on the platform. I don't want to even show like my sneakers. I don't even want to have a camera to do this thing anymore. How can I do it without it? And then I was like, well, I'm playing a game all day long. Like, I'm sitting in the crib playing GTA. I'm sitting in the crib playing like Call of Duty, doing all this stuff. I'm like, how can I do it in a way to where, you know, I don't got to show my face. I could just, you know, let my game in, kind of get the views in, and then I make money from that. And it was just like a bingo. Like I had, um, I had these Yeezys, right? And it, it's like, I traded my first love for like, you know what I'm saying, my, my new thing. Um, I had these Yeezys that I, I waited in line for, for a long time. Um, and I tried to get them and I got them. And so what I ended up doing was I needed a laptop, like to do the gaming, I needed, I needed like a, a little setup. I needed a laptop. Um, I needed an Elgato capture card. I needed all these things to like, you know, make sure my gaming was good. Um, but I just started with the laptop. And so I found this guy on like offer up and I was like, yo, I got these Yeezys and I see you got this MacBook. I don't got the money for it, but I can get these shoes. And then, you know what I'm saying? You can give me a laptop. And we did it. Like I remember me know with him, my friend um, on the east side of LA. He traded it, he gave it to me. And that from that moment on, I just really started putting my time into like using it and leveraging what I had to do it. So I'm like taking game clips off my Xbox, uploading it to Xbox DVR online, downloading on my laptop. I'm on iMovie, I'm putting like all of my video game clips together. I'm taking my iPhone, doing my voiceover. Like literally like what, what I had. Um, and that's how like I made my first 5,000 on YouTube, right? But before it was just five cents. So when I'm standing at the register, and I'm like looking at my dashboard and I see that, I don't even know if it was five cents. It may have been a fifth of a cent. Whatever it was, I saw money. And I just saw it and I was like, yo, you can really make money from this. Like that inspired me. So when I saw it at that register in my head, I'm just like, okay, how I do this a million times? Like that's my mindset was the whole time. 
And so from five cents to five million, it was just like, you know, that's literally what it was from that moment on. Yeah. You know what? We could, we're we're going to get into the, we're going to get into the how to. Yeah. But I think there's something important that you mentioned, which is like, at the center of everything is the belief. Right. Is the thought that like, I made one cent or I made five cents. Yeah. I can go make five million. Yeah. Like that belief is special, right? And I think a lot of the times that's what's, that's the piece that's missing. That's the piece that people are missing. And so I'm curious, like just from your, just from your life at that point, what gave you this belief of like, I'm working at Macy's right now, but like, I can take this to the point where this is like a different life. Okay, we spend 50% of our time at work. So it's critical that you enjoy your work. That said, the sponsor of today's show, Free Agency, is gonna help you do just that and be properly compensated for it. Free Agency represents and manages talent in the tech industry. They provide you with a dedicated talent agent that will help you find and win top of market roles. So, if you're looking to build your dream career today, go to the link in my description. I've hooked you up, I've helped you out. Use Free Agency, you will not regret it. I just mean like, for me, and it's crazy because like I, I see it from like at this point, from when I was at that point, I always just took inspiration. Like that's just been my biggest thing. And so I was inspired by a lot of YouTubers on the platform. Um, and when I see that somebody can do something, it's, it's literally like, I always say this to like my students, right? If you have a competitor on the platform, you have a blueprint. Somebody has already did it. The, the secret to success, the shortcut to success is literally just doing exactly what somebody has already, like literally going to the source and figuring out how to do it, almost like a mentor. And so I didn't want to make any mistakes, although I did, but I learned that if I just followed in the steps of the people who are already where I wanted to be and just kind of followed their framework and their blueprint on how they came up on a platform, that was just the same way I was going to do it. And so that's kind of like how I just saw it from that angle. It's like, I always just have this strong belief in myself when I want to do something, like I'm gonna make it happen. Like I literally call myself Mr. Make It Happen because I'm always gonna just go head first or something and really just be determined to get it done. And so um, I just had that same mindset with YouTube. I, it was cool, like I love music. I was adding that flavor to my videos. I was adding my own taste to it. People were enjoying it. Um, and I just feel like, I just had this feeling that it, that was what it was for me. Like it, this was what it was. Like I always told myself like when I grow up, I wanna be me. And because people always used to ask me, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I could never answer the question because it was just so many things. Not that I didn't know what I wanted to be. It was just so many things that I could have been. Um, and I just couldn't choose. I didn't know if I wanted to be a doctor, a lawyer or whatever. Like, it was just too many things to choose. But I always knew I wanted to be me. And so when YouTube presented itself, that was like my opportunity to be me because YouTube is about you. Mm. So, yeah. No, I love that. I love that. Yeah. You know what? There's this thing... Um and I feel it so much on my journey and even with the arc of how this content has gone, which is, and I always tell myself this, first you get good, then you get the results. Right. So like a lot of the times people will even hear, uh, people even hear like the YouTube millionaire or these faceless YouTube channels and the amount that you're making and they focus on the results. They're like fixated on the millions and the millions of views. But like before any of that, you have to get good at the craft of YouTube. And so I want to know about like that first 5,000, like tell me about that journey of just like getting good at the platform, yeah, like yeah. getting good at YouTube. Just the equation, right? And the formula. So like for me, I already, like I said, seen people who were doing really well. And so my first video on the gaming side, right? So the sneakers was like, I was like, I was getting like, I think my most viewed video on the, on the sneaker channel was like 12,000 views, right? And so I'm like, okay, that's cool, but I, I need to like really, you know, go crazier. And so when I jumped into gaming, my first gaming video only got a hundred views in a month. But I said to myself, right, and I've always been this way, like I will never go for outside support. Like when I make a new social media account, YouTube channel, I'm not sending it to my friends and family like, oh, subscribe, because I just know that they're just subscribing because it's me. They're not subscribing because they're gonna enjoy the content, right? Um, and that's a bar right there, but for the most part, I'll start scratch. So I started from scratch, got 100 views on my first video in a month. I said, you know what? For a channel with zero subscribers, to get 100 views in a month, that's cool. Like, but like, how did I get 100 people to watch my video that have that not even following me, right? And so from that moment, I said, let me go back to the drawing board. 
and just figure this out. Um, and so when I went back to the drawing board, I, I checked on my competitors. I seen, okay, this is how they doing their thumbnails, right? And I really sucked at thumbnails, but I made it happen, right? I said, this is how they're doing their thumbnails. Okay, this is how they're getting the viewer locked into the video. This is what they're doing to get the viewer to stick onto the video. And so my second video on that channel got half a million views. Like my second video, I'm like, and then back then YouTube money was a lot better, right? And it was crazier because it was around that like, you know, that season. So that video overall made like $5,000. Right. And so when I saw that, I was just like, OK, I figured I figured out that equation. But what I learned is that in number one, when I started blowing up, it was always the thumbnail, like getting the viewer to click. That was the first thing I learned about, like the algorithm is the first thing the viewer sees is a thumbnail. Right. You treat it like a book in the library. Nobody's ever going to pick up a book and start reading the middle of the book. That's just not going to happen. They got to look at the cover of the book. They got to look at the back summary. They got to read it before they even decide if they want to pick it up and read it. And if, if you're not watching, if not reading books, maybe you watch Netflix. Nobody ever goes on Netflix, just click on a movie and start watching it. You got to see the actor. You got to see the trailer. You got to see all these things before you decide to click. So it's the same framework with YouTube. People see that thumbnail and they already in their mind are making up if they want to click it subconsciously. They're not saying if they're going to click it or not, but subconsciously they are saying that. And so the biggest thing that I learned is like the importance of that. Like when a viewer sees this, how can I get them to click this video without a question, right? I want them to question it, like what he really did that, like how did he do that? And I also want to spark curiosity. So that's just like the first step in the formula is that initial curiosity and getting to ask a question, right? Now, as I go more into the formula, the second thing I learned was not only getting people to click the video, but now we got to get them to watch it. Like in the beginning, you know, clickbait was, yeah, we was clickbaiting and all that. It was, like we didn't care if they, you know what I'm saying? We just wanted them yeah. to click the video. Like some people gonna watch it, some people not, but at least we getting it, right? But I was young on the platform, I didn't know that. But as my time grew, it was like, okay, so we understand the thumbnail. What does that mean? What is that about? What metric correlates to that? And that's the CTR, the click-through rate, mm -hmm. right? If 100 people see this video, I need at least 15 to 20 of them to click it. That tells YouTube that, you know, this is a video that most of the platform that sees it will 20% or 15 to 20% of people will click it. That's a high CTR, right? But now it's not just your CTR. It's your CTR plus the, the, the duration of the video being viewed. So the average viewer's duration, right? And so I learned very quickly from a lot of people on the platform, I was um, really close friends with uh, a YouTuber named Kados, a big Fortnite YouTuber. Like he, he used to make my thumbnails. He went and started a YouTube channel and his channel went crazy. Like it was, it was insane. Um, but he told me, he was like, yeah, you want to shoot for 40% on your average viewer duration. And so I'm like, okay, I'm picking up little things from people I'm networking with and I'm seeing results from my own videos. And he was telling me like every single time I get a video, that has 40% like average year duration, it never flops, right? And so I learned that quickly and I just started to understand that more, just those two metrics. And then it kind of goes back to that simplicity of the whole platform and the idea of it. All YouTube wants people to do is click the video and watch it, enjoy it, share it and things of that nature. So as soon as I learned that, it kind of just, you know, it was like, it was open now. now. Now the equation made more sense. Right. And so when it comes to just understanding the craft of YouTube, it's creating great videos for an audience of people that truly want to watch it and, and desire the content and to share it and, and just to keep it going. Right. A lot of times people start and they don't they don't know that they just think that they can make any kind of video that has some type of virality, put no effort into making the video, but just know that it did well on somebody else's channel and they try and just replicate it. But it's like if you don't. If you don't understand that in the first five to 10 seconds, the viewer has to be hooked in or they're not going to watch the rest of the video. Like you got to give the viewer exactly what they click for. So if on a thumbnail, you're talking about the fastest way to tie your shoe, right? In the first five seconds, you need to be showing them how to tie your shoe fast. And then in the rest of the video, you're giving them the five steps on how to do it, mm. right? Which is going to keep them all the way through. But you're just briefing them in the beginning. You're giving them what they click for, but now they want to know how to do it, right? If I make a video talking about how to make your first $10,000 a month, Right in the beginning of the video, I'm going to say, hey, in today's video, guys, I'm going to break down how I made $10,000 in a single month from doing this business model. Mm -hmm. But my name is such, such and so let's get into the video. The first step you want to do is you want to create this. Right. So I'm literally telling them 
in the beginning of the video, like, hey, this is why you clicked on it and this is what I'm about to give you and then I break it down. Mm -hmm. So just understanding that formula and that framework to solve that equation. And that's just, you know, kind of like how my brain was just starting to work on the platform as I was starting from that person working at Macy's to like this YouTube guru just going crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? What you just broke down is the perfect breakdown of like the foundation of right. YouTube. Right. Like that's where you have to start. If you literally just started with, I care about thumbnail, getting someone to click, viewer retention, and you just studied those two things, right. that would probably get you your first, that can, that's probably your first 100,000 subscribers right there. Just focused on those two things. And it's funny because like, and I did the exact th like mistake, which is you focus on all the shit that like, it's extras. Like everyone's like really focused on like, they want the finest production and the like- The cleanest, the cleanest video quality, the yeah. highest. But it's like, bro, they will never see that video. The first thing they see is the thumbnail. Mm. Like that's the first thing that's like when you go to a restaurant, the first thing you see is the front of the, like you don't see the food that they cook in the kitchen. Mm. You got to get the people to walk through the door first before you can even tell them what you're selling them. So it's the same thing with YouTube. Like the person has to be locked in from the thumbnail. If they're not locked in from there, like the video could be amazing. Mm. And that's another big mistake people make. They get on a platform and they make these amazing videos and then they get to the upload studio and they upload it. And at the end of the steps, they're like, oh, a thumbnail. Oh, I'm just gonna choose this piece in the video. Like, I'm just gonna choose this part in the video, and that's gonna be something like, no, bro, like that's that's not gonna do it. Mm -hmm. Nobody's gonna see it because there's nothing that's telling them to click it. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, it's just a title and a clip of the video. We're not in the days where, I don't know, like world star hip hop, like MySpace, like we're not in those days no more where people just see a title and they're already <laughs> like, no, like your competitors have like, I know Mr. Beast and them, they sit around for hours with teams of people going through thumbnail psychology, trying to figure out mm -hmm. the best ways to like get people to click on videos and like understanding and studying like how it happened before and how it's like working for somebody. Like it's it's a whole psychology behind it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and so that's just one of the bigger mistakes I think people are making. Like they just get on and they they skip the the, the most important pieces, like saving a thumbnail for last. Sometimes, I, not all the time, I, honestly. If I don't have a thumbnail, I don't got a video. Like, if you don't got a thumbnail, you ain't got a video. Like, I won't even start the video without the thumbnail. Like, I always do that backwards. I know it's kind of different when you have a podcast because it's like, you know, it's the podcast. So you got to do, you got to get the content before you do that. But for me, um, just with videos in general, like, the thumbnail is always first. Mm. Like, because that's what the viewer is going to see first. You know, that is, that is such a key insight. And it's like the whole performance and mm. arc of this channel right. shifted when I realized that. I remember listening to... Um, I was watching this YouTube video. It's like a round table of all these like huge creators. Right. All got like 10 million, 12 million subs. Right. They, and they said exactly what you said. They yeah. start with the thumbnail. Yeah. So they'll have like an idea that they're like, is kind of good. But the way that they're even measuring if the idea is good is based on the thumbnail. It starts there. And like what you said is exactly right. I think the novice YouTuber starts with building this video and spends hours trying to get this masterpiece. And then almost as like the final thought, it's like, oh, I need a thumbnail yeah, for it. Yeah. And then just throw something out. And, but that's like, and, and they, it's like, they do it so fast. Like that's, that's their fastest piece in the puzzle. And it's like, that's like, no, like that is the most important thing. Like it's the most important ingredient. That's mm -hmm. what they see first. And so, yeah, I just, I, that's like a, it's like my students, I always get on them about that. Like, make sure your thumbnail is good. Like, like don't sit here and make your thumbnail. Just go get one. Like, just mm. go buy one. Because it's going to make the video do better. Mm. Like, always. Yeah. You know, okay. So, first video that you ever post, yeah, 100 views in a month. Right. Second video that you post goes crazy. Half a million. Take me back to that moment. Like, what are the, what are the emotions... Are you even still working at Macy's at the time? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I was still working. I was still working 9 to 5. But I was just like, like overnight, like it hit 10,000 views. And I was just like, what did I do? Like, it was crazy. And then in that week, like all these other YouTubers in the community was hitting me like, yo, like you're going crazy. Like, you know what I'm saying? You need to keep it. Let's, let's connect. And that's kind of like how it started. Mm. Um, but nah, just like a, it was exciting. It was like, I finally did something. Like, I finally did something that I was like, like I, like, I didn't want to say I knew it was going to happen because I didn't, but I just didn't think it was going to happen that fast. Mm. 
Like I didn't think I was gonna get that many views that fast. I didn't think it was gonna start growing that fast. And then it was so crazy because the way YouTube works is, and I didn't know this then, but I know this now, is this like this snowball effect, right? And so when I posted my next video, all those people that watched that video were recommended it, the next video, right? And so I'm getting views from just people that watch that video. And that kind of carried my channel all the way to that first like 100,000 subscriber mark from that one video. Mm. And so um, that's that's something that was just like insane to me. It made me just stay consistent. It made me take it serious right away. A lot of times people get on YouTube, they don't take it serious right away. They just kind of playing with a little bit here and there, video here, video there, they're not staying consistent. But because I saw success so fast and I saw money coming in that I never seen in my life, I was like, yeah, like I'm, I got the bug. I'm posting every day. Mm. I'm talking getting off work. 10, 11, coming to the crib and one bedroom apartment. I got the, the Ikea set up in the corner. I ain't got no office. I'm up late, two, two in the morning, busting down videos, making sure it's uploaded, scheduled for the next day, come back from work, do the same thing every single day. Like, and that's just all I'm like worried about. And that's just me like in the beginning, this is before I even automated. This is just me doing the groundwork and putting them 10,000 man hours on my own channel, like running it myself. I'm still faceless, but just like, man, it was incredible. It was a great feeling. Uh, it's just like, it was it was quick success, but I just knew that if I wanted to just keep doing what I was doing, I had to just stay consistent. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So first you get good, then you get results. Right. I'm curious, when you say like you started taking it serious, I think the first thing that kind of pops out to me is like, and I think all the best, the people that really dominate on YouTube, I think they all do this, which is like studying, like they study the platform, like they're they, they're so hyper aware of like trends mm -hmm. or thumbnails or like this thumbnail worked, but it worked like nine months ago. So it yeah. might not be good now. Yeah. Can you just talk about like the process of studying? Like even in that second video, it seems like you really studied after the first one and implemented things in the second one. Talk like people don't get what that means, the studying aspect. Hey, if you guys are really liking what you're listening to and you're interested in learning how I went from working at a nine to five at Macy's, literally making pennies on a dollar per hour to becoming a seven figure YouTube automation creator um, where I primarily don't show my face on a platform. I never create a single video myself. If you wanna learn exactly how that's done, I actually have a free workshop every single Sunday you can come to. Um, you know, you can click the link down below of this actual podcast episode and you know, go ahead and register and I'll see you guys on Sunday. We call it market research. It's just like a market research play. So typically what I do is I'll go to the search engine and I'll put in my keywords. Um, and this is just a big gem for people who just, if they don't know how to title videos, um, you can always go to the search engine and just type it in. So if you wanted to create a video, but you didn't know how to title it with keywords and you wanna know what people are looking up, just type the idea title in the, in the search engine and whatever comes up first, those are the videos that are people are most likely searching up. Like that's the highest search result. But I'll search it up. Then what I'll do is I'll filter it for this month. Then I'll filter it for four to 20 minutes. Then I'll filter it for um, highest view count. And then it'll show me all the most viewed videos in the last 30 days. But not only will it do that, it'll show me the people who are the, the channels that are doing well. And then what I'll do is I'll go into those channels and I'll see the channels with the least subscribers with the most views. Because if I go to a channel that has like 2 million subscribers and they got a video with half a million views in the first three days, that's a beautiful video. But at the same time, it's like, I can't gauge if those views came from the subscriber base or it came from YouTube pushing it out. But if I see a channel with 2000 subscribers and their video got half a million views in like four or five days, I'm like, okay, that channel subscriber base doesn't have the reach to get to that amount of people. So that means that this topic is so hot that YouTube is pushing it crazy so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna see what the video is. If it's exactly in my niche, I'm gonna make it way better. I'm gonna make the thumbnail better. I'm gonna make the title better. I'm just gonna upload it and I'm gonna get the same, if not better result. So that's really like understanding like trend hacking or trying to figure out what's hot on a platform. Um, that search engine is, is really good. Now they got like AI software, it's like ytastudio.com, um, which is primarily for YouTube automation. Um, but there's so many different like sites that you can use that'll do it for you. But I personally like to manually do it and go see what's going on right now. Um, I do sort it by the year for some, some for some niches, but for the most part, if I want to know what's popping right now, 
and I want to get in front of an audience right now, I'm always going to filter it for that 30 days. And I'm going to look for the you know highest view count and the smallest channels that's getting that view count. It's just telling me what's right. It's literally showing me right there like, okay, this is what's hot right now. And if you redo this video and make it better, you're going to get a better result. Yeah. You know what? There's, there's two key things that you mentioned, right? So yeah. like the first is the relevance. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'll see, so I even made this mistake. You'll look at videos that went crazy, mm -hmm. went crazy six years ago, yeah. five years ago. Yeah. And you're looking at the view count now, like, and trying to base a video off that now. Yeah. That's not current. It's right. not relevant. Right. And then um, I think the second piece is like kind of understanding what channels you're looking at, right? right. Like the game isn't the same for everyone. You can't, everyone has to play their own game. Right. So for me, example, I might look at like a massive podcast that has right. like three, four million subscribers. Right. And the way that they did the thumbnail and title, that might not necessarily work, work for right. me because right. they, they already have an established audience. Right. So people give them more of an opportunity. Yeah. And so I think what you said is it's so key, which is like, Finding those smaller channels that's doing some right where they have like outliers, yeah, where their vi their videos were getting like two hundred views, right, and then one has like fifty thousand. Right, that is kind of you're looking for those spikes. Mm -hmm. So good, yeah. Just studying the market, like that market research play is like is dangerous, like because it it just reveals it literally reveals everything that's going on that's doing well, and mm. so you could just really apply that to your channel. It's gonna go crazy. Yeah, yeah. When was the point when you like left your job? Like you, man, I got that plaque. Um, I got a hundred thousand subscriber plaque, man. And I literally, it was something that happened at work. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It was a little, little like not altercation, but it was just a lot of like head bumping going on with me and management. And I just kind of was like, bro, I'm done with this. Like I mm. literally text my boss. So I was like, um, yeah, I'm like, I'm done. I'm quitting. No two weeks notice. Um, my boss texted me back. Like, Do you want to come up here and get your check? I said, no, you can mail it to me. Mm. Like, like literally, and I haven't worked a job since. since. Yeah. Um, and then after that, it just was kind of like just relying on me really focusing all on YouTube. Um, and it just kind of went crazy for me from there. I was probably making like five to 10,000 a month at that time off of YouTube, probably had like $40,000 saved. And I just kind of ran it up from there. And then within that next year, it was my first like seven figure year. And that's when I like, got into the YouTube automation business model. And so from there, I like never look back. Like even to this day, it's just like, I'm not, I don't care what happens. Yeah. I will go back to the drawing board and do my videos myself before I go work for somebody. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Sometimes I think that that shift from like doing something as almost as if it's a side hustle right. and then it starts taking off yeah. and then all of a sudden the side hustle becomes the main hustle. Yeah. I think that shift, that transition can be difficult. Talk about like those initial moments, like you've decided to leave your job. Was there even like a bit of like a, a void of like, how am I going to keep this going? I know there's also, I think a lot of creators as well. It's like, can I consistently get this performance or did I just kind of, was I hot for a minute? I just feel like that's more of a personal thing with most people. Me, I'm like, I'm just determined, bro. Like I'll take crazy risk in life like crazy risk. Um, and I'm always super calculated when I do it. But like for me, it was just like when I when I quit my nine to five, I was for sure like I'm gonna be successful. Like I'm not like this, like like my mentor always says, it has to work or it has to work. There is no plan B. Like I'm sticking to this. And so I was just so confident and just so determined that I was gonna be successful that, you know, I just I just didn't look back. And I know for most creators it's hard because they, they're saying that, like, what do I got to do to make sure that I keep on making the same money? I got to keep going viral. I got to keep getting these views. And so that, that, that for me was just like more of a confidence type of thing. I just really believed in myself and I just knew that I could do it and I could make it out um, because I just had that mindset. Like, if I can make my first 10,000, I can make my first 100,000, make my first 1 million, make my first 10. Like, it literally just that same mentality for me just going in. But yeah, no, nah, I, I, I never looked back. I never once like second guessed and said, I got to go get another job through that whole process. Even through times where, I mean, bro, I had a channel, the same gaming channel, get to 50,000 subscribers. This is after, I think, I was still working my nine to five, right? But 50,000 subscribers, 
and the channel completely taken off the platform, terminated. So I'm still working my nine to five, but terminated. I was hurt, bro. Like, I mean, we were running it up, like 50,000 subscribers and I ain't never like, it was crazy. I literally ended up going back to the sneaker channel. When I went back to the sneaker channel, all I did was the same exact thing I did on that other gaming channel and ran it up again crazy. Then I got to 100,000 subscribers and then that's when I quit. But like, even still, like anybody at that moment, they'd be comfortable at their job and they just would say, well, it didn't work, I'm done. Like if I would have just let that defeat me, I wouldn't have been like, you know, super mm -hmm. self. So that's why I say like, it really is the confidence in me that made me just say like, you know what, I, I can really do this and go crazy. Mm. So You know, actually, I think that's super interesting, which is like mm. the focus, yeah. which is because you had the experience yeah. from the first channel, yeah. it's like when you're doing the second channel, yeah. you can get the result like three times as fast, four times yeah. as oh, fast. Oh, it was fast. Because you're only doing what matters. Yeah. So lay it out for people like that second channel, when you started it and you were like running it up, right. what was the exact process like what was your the exact top, focus the top videos that was on the other channel i just did them again mm. and i only focused on those um and it was crazy because like that the video when the channel was down there was like literally no like i couldn't see anything so i just literally focused on i had my thumbnails in my file on my laptop so i kind of knew what those videos were and it got the same result and it just ran up again and i got to 100,000 subscribers way faster than i got to 50,000 subscribers on the last channel so i was just like really going crazy, like three to four months, I was at 100,000 subscribers. And I was like, I don't even need that channel no more. Although I ended up getting it back. Mm. And I think I had like a $6,000 check that month or a $7,000 check, and ended up adding it to my asses account and giving it back. But that was like, I think honestly, that moment is what really made me like super successful with the platform. Because sometimes you need to take a big L, like you need to fail real hard and really just be tested to see how bad you want it. And that really made me like, yo, I want this thing bad. Like, I don't care if I gotta do it all over again. I think I had 3,000 subscribers on that sneaker channel. I said, bro, I was too close. I was halfway to 100,000. I just want that plaque. And I did it all over again. That really just like tested who I was. And so I feel like that moment there, I'm glad it happened. Like some people were like say, man, I regret this being taken out. I could have got to this fat. Nah, like that. That made me like, I needed that. I needed that. I needed that failure. I needed that L because it just taught me, number one, that if I could do it one time, I could do it again. And it also taught me to like have multiple channels. So if something happened, at least you got another channel still running up. Mm, yeah. That makes sense. You know what's interesting? Like I'm, I'm such a big believer in that. I'm such a big believer in like, you're going to get tested. And it's like, there's going to be a test and it's going to come at a point where you're like, you're, you're really in the trenches. Like it's going to feel like so real, but it's, I think the beautiful thing about it is like, God is almost like, if you're serious, yeah. if you're truly serious yeah. and I'm going to test you to make sure you're truly serious, yeah. you can get everything. Yeah. Like you can get anything. And so like, once you overcome that hurdle, it's yeah. like your, your mindset is in a different place. Yeah. Like it's you like get nothing, locked in different. Nothing can stop you. Yeah. Like nothing. Like it was like, Man, it's like YouTube take this channel, it's all good. I'm and I always had that like little fear in the back of my head, like, yo, what if it happens again? But I just I just was like, they can take anything from me. As long as I have the experience, as long as I have the knowledge, the skill is in my head, it doesn't matter. I can make it come out of thin air. Like literally make it appear out of thin air just by me having access to what I got access to and doing what I did to get to where I was at. Mm. So yeah. It's the confidence level. It's yeah. like uh that Drake line, like my confidence level is getting settled. Yeah. Like as soon as that takes place yeah. and you have the skills, like you're actually good. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a wrap. You're untouchable. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. Okay. So you get to the point, um, 100K subs. At what point do you even have a team? Like are there people helping you at yeah. this point? Or are so you just doing all yourself? All I had was a thumbnail artist. Um, and then I was dibbling down with a video editor. But I transitioned to the automation like side of things when there was like, so basically what happened was there was this time on YouTube where Twitch streamer clips were going insane. Like you, you, like you can blow up off of like other people's content, like crazy, right? And so I saw that as an opportunity and I was like, yo, like I like this, this style of niche. And that's kind of where the whole YouTube automation thing started. Um, and so before Fiverr or Upwork, I went on to Twitter 
because that's typically where you find your thumbnail artists in that niche, right? You find your thumbnail artists on Twitter, you find your video editors on Twitter, pretty much everything. But for this specific niche, all I needed was a video editor, a thumbnail artist. I didn't need a script writer. And I, I think I need, I think I had like a voiceover artist because I didn't want to use my voice. Um, the first month, that channel made like 70 bucks. The second month, channel made 70,000. Bro, I said, what have I been doing? Like, and I didn't even make any of the videos. Like I didn't, all I did was manage the people who were making it. And so this was like my first like endeavor into the automation side. I'm like, I'm like, bro, what? Like, it just blew my mind. Cause one thing about me that I learned too on the platform is getting in front of the audience. You don't necessarily have to build an audience because the audience is already there. You just got to figure out ways to get in front of them. I know people don't care too much about David Omari, but I know people care about people like Drake, LeBron James, you know what I'm saying? Stephen Curry, like people that are already like getting searched up every single day. So I knew it was a bunch of streamers out there who were getting crazy views and I knew they had an audience. If I collage all of them in a, in a video and all their favorite like fans are looking their clips up, guess where they going to land? They going to land on my channel. And so it was, it was insane. Like, I mean, from $70 months to $140,000 months, like on a channel like that, just going insane. Like, and so after that part, I was like, okay, this is where I'm like, if I can do this with gaming videos and make a cool little RPM CPM, which for the you know people viewing this, CPM cost per milestone um, and RPM revenue per milestone, I believe, those are just the amounts of dollars you get paid per thousand views. And when you're in the gaming niche, your RPM isn't going to be high because you're targeting a lot of like younger audiences. So they're most likely not going to spend money on ads and stuff like that. But in the business space and in the sports niches and all these other niches, that RPM and CPM starts to get a lot higher because why? Number one, with gaming videos, they're targeting mainly children and a lot of them have violence. But with the NBA niche, NFL niche, the soccer niche, those niches are incredible because they have no violence. They're not necessarily targeting children. And so it was like kind of a sweet spot for me. And then that's how I transitioned into the whole like full on voice actor, video editor, script writer, thumbnail artist, right? That whole entire process. And um, when I transitioned to that, my first video was like $50, right? Um, I spent $15 on a voiceover artist, a script writer and a video editor. So 15 each. And then I spent $5 on a thumbnail. That single video ended up making like 10,000, right? So it was like $10,700. And so I took like $2,700, pay my, pay my rent, pay everything I had to pay, took $8,000 and I just dumped it back in and gave it to the team. Got 160 videos. That 160 videos ended up making like $466,000 just from that one $8,000 investment. And so that was like a $50 seed that I planted on the platform with the whole automation business. And then that just kind of took it to that next level from there. Mm -hmm. And then I learned really quickly that it, it really don't cost money to make money. Like you just can create the dollars, then the dollars you create, you can reinvest it back into your channel and the channel is creating the production costs. Mm -hmm. So I never came out of pocket to create that. I literally took $50 in terms of half a million. And that is all from what the channel was printing. And still to this day, I got channels where I'm doing that. I'm like buying videos that initially spark the channel up, give me that initial investment back and some, and then I take whatever I get and just throw it back in and it starts to make that money. Mm. So yeah, that's just really how I like transition from me doing it to like hiring teams, organizing them and everything and just automating the whole process. Yeah. yeah. You know what's interesting is like, and it came across even when we spoke a couple of days ago, like before yeah. this is... You actually really like you love YouTube. Like you actually spend it. time yeah. on YouTube. Yeah. And I think sometimes the problem I hear is like people have these questions of should I do YouTube or maybe like I should do crypto yeah. or like like they have like these different trends or maybe I should do AI or like yeah. these different trends that yeah. they want to follow. Mm. But they actually they don't care about that thing. Mm. And so even when I'm listening to you, it's like the reason it worked is because you liked YouTube enough mm -hmm. that you were going to get obsessive. 
Yeah. Like most people are not going to see the insight in the moment mm. that they need to see it mm. with like, oh, people are, all these Twitch streamers are getting reposted to YouTube. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to start doing that sort of content and that's how we're going to run it up. Right. But the reason that you even saw that is because you love the platform. You yeah. naturally spent time yeah. on the platform. And I think a lot of the times the problem I see is like, people need, it. the first thought needs to be like, where do I actually spend time? Right. Like you're trying to run up a bag on YouTube, but you're never on YouTube. Yeah. You just like, you just, it's, it's not one of them things that you can just see as like a, a get rich quick scheme. Mm. Like a lot of times people see it like that. Like they'll see a lot of people making money from it, especially the automation business model. They see it and they're just like, oh man, that's like, you know, digital real estate, passive income. I want to do that, but have no desire for the platform. Like you don't mm. want to learn it. You don't want to study people in it. Like you don't want to do market research. You just looking at it as a, like a side hustle and you can't do that. Um, and I feel like anything in life though, really, if you, if you approach it with the mindset of I just want to make money from this, it's truly never going to be what it's supposed to be because you just starting off with that initiative of like, yo, I just want to make money out of this. Yeah, don't get me wrong. When I started, I just wanted, I, I did want to make some money from YouTube, but I had a passion for what I was putting on YouTube. I had a passion for sneakers. I had a passion for gaming. Mm -hmm. I had a passion for content creation and really just sitting there at like, to this day, right? I just got a brand new estate, right? I'm having a YouTube studio built out in my estate, gaming PCs, gaming chairs, consoles, everything. Grand Theft Auto 6 just got announced like two weeks ago or a week ago. I'm literally going to do exactly what I did when I first started. Not because I need the money, because I just love, like, that's what I love to do. I like to sit down, get gameplay, put it on the track, edit. Like, I like, that's just what I like to do. Play music in the background. That's just like my thing. Mm -hmm. So I just feel like if people don't have that initial like love for the platform, you, you will see some success. But if it starts to feel like a job, you're not going to want to keep doing it. Like it can't be a job to you. It has to be like, it has to be in you. You gotta be true to it, not new to it, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's just like my biggest thing too, is just like really having that passion for the platform and loving the hobby and loving the the creativity. Mm -hmm. You know saying? That's just my big thing right there. Yeah. You know what? I think there's certain people that, there are a lot of people that love YouTube, especially yeah. like this generation. Like there's yeah. a lot of people that want to be YouTubers. Yeah. And so if we take that as a given and there's someone that's listening, that's like, they want to do what you've done. Right. Let's get, let's get into the, the automation stuff. Yeah. I'm curious, is there, can you almost like automate too early? And here's what I mean when I say that. When I listen to your story, you got good at the platform yourself yeah. first. Yeah. Like you put in the hard yards yeah. to like truly like master the platform, understand right. the algorithm, right. understand how to study, like what makes a good video, what makes right. a clickable video. Right. Can someone that's just starting from scratch be like, oh, I'm going to, come into YouTube and like, I don't know, maybe watch a few videos on how to do it. Yeah. And then I can just hire a team and outsource it. Or do they need to do all of those steps themselves first right. to truly get good? So two things. One, it'd be, it be amazing to like, pe for people to get on a platform, learn it and do the work their self. But in this day and age, people are just not going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I would, if I had to start all over again, I would do it the same exact way. Get up, like literally just learning the platform because it's not just about, I mean, it is just about the video, but it's about how the video was made. It's about who you're targeting. Like, it's so many little things that people skip out. Um, and I always say this to like, you know, people, you know, before they decide they want to be a student, I'm like, listen, you, if you go and do it on your own, right, you're going to go straight to Fiverr. You're going to hire your team. You're going to outsource them. You're going to tell them to make a video that you saw. You're going to post a video and it's going to flop because you just skip like 20 steps, which is gonna set you back because you don't you don't understand the platform. You don't understand how to optimize your channel to even be seen in that, in that space. You don't understand how to optimize your videos. You don't understand like the things that you need to do. You don't understand posting times. You, don't, you just don't understand it, right? And so what I would say is, it's nothing wrong with people doing it like just jumping on, but you have to really understand, you have to study and know the algorithm, understand the platform, understand the audiences, before you do it. And so, yes, you can start YouTube automation from scratch right now, you know what I'm saying? But you have to do it in those, the, the, you have to follow the whole process, mm -hmm. right? Create the channel, go get the channel art, decide what the name of the channel is gonna be, decide what niche you wanna go into. Some people get on a platform, don't even have it, like, you don't even have a niche. Like, mm -hmm. you just out here posting videos, you don't, you don't even know what you're doing. So you gotta figure that out, you gotta get a niche, right? 
Once you do that, now you start to look at, okay, let's get a bunch of videos. Let's look at a bunch of videos on a platform that's doing really well. Let's study a whole bunch of channels, right? Start to figure this out, create a, a, a notepad, put all the links to those videos and kind of understand the flow of it. Watch it for about a week. Really understand your audience when they post, right? NBA channels. Most NBA channels, people don't notice, they post at 6, 7 p.m. Why they do that? Because most NBA games around, they start around those times. Like people don't see like little stuff like that, that are, that's important, right? And so also with that, they had to understand when you're hiring a team, you don't just hire the team. You have to actually get sampled work from the team. So like the biggest thing I always do is before I pay them a dime and I'll say, hey, here's this script. Can you write a script similar to this, right? Just give me a short sentence or a paragraph, right? Or hey, voiceover artist, can you speak with this tone of voice, right? Can you like be chipper? Can you be bubbly? Can you be, you know, um, what is it like Southern? Like you, there's so many different types of voices that you're going for with a specific niche, right? Can you be dark? Like it's so many tones. Then with the video editor, I need exact edits and transitions like this. Can you send me a sample of a video? Five seconds with this transition, right? And it can pretty much tell you everything about a video editor if they can do what you need them to do. Like, are you using this software to edit your videos, right? Are you using Final Cut? Are you using Adobe Premiere? Like, what are you using? Right. And the thumbnail artist, just send them a thumbnail. Say, can you make an exact thumbnail like this? I'm not going to steal it from you. It's literally the exact thumbnail. I just need to make you make it slightly different. I just want to see if you can do the work that I want before you even spend a dime. Because a lot of people that are going into this business model and they're going in a hole because they just don't they don't understand the steps, mm -hmm. the formula. Right. And so after that, once you have done all of that, then you're good to just say, OK, I know how to make a killer video. I know the components I need for this video. I know how this edit needs to be. They like the the team has to under also understand like the formula on YouTube. You can't just hire somebody to edit a video who may be editing like regular videos for like, I don't know, weddings and things of that nature. Right. You got to hire somebody that actually understands YouTube and knows how to like cut when they need to cut. They need to understand how to keep a viewer locked in and engaged, right? They, the voice actor needs to understand or the script writer needs to understand how to write the script in a way to where you're asking for engagement. You're asking for that person to subscribe, right? You're not just narrating a script by your, or you're not just writing a script out like it's an article. You're actually writing it in a way that a YouTube video is supposed to be like produced. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot of little things that people don't know. And that's why, you know, I always say just get a mentor. Like mm -hmm. you don't want to make a mistake, like get a mentor. Somebody that's already doing it so you can learn the proper way of doing it. And then you can get that desired result opposed to going in the dark. You then drop like three videos. They all flopped. And you're like, ah, oh, it's a scam. It doesn't work. Mm. It's not that it doesn't work. The work work. But there's no change unless you change. So you got to just jump on and really understand what you're doing before you go and do it. It's just a process. Yeah. yeah. You know, when I when I listen to your your story, it's like, first, you kind of, you developed like the mastery, the expertise. Right. And then the team was just a way for you to scale yeah, that but, expertise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And... You know what's interesting? I think any everyone that I've spoken to, and it's not just YouTube, it's any field. Yeah. Everyone kind of goes through what I call like the dark place. Right. Which is typically in the beginning, there's a process where like you're just not good. Yeah. And like you have to go through this painstaking process of getting good. Yeah. Which me in the YouTube sense, and this is what it meant for me, is like we post an episode of the podcast, right. gets like 100, 150 views. Right. We go back to the drawing board, analyze all the reasons why like we mm. could improve it, improve one thing for the next episode, publish that, better. 10 more views, and you just iteratively keep getting better. And it's the dark place because it's like, you're not getting any validation yeah. from what you're doing. Right. But that is the whole, that's the whole process. That's yeah. you getting good. Yeah. That's where like you emerge from that and you're yeah. the yeah. master. Right. And that's where a lot of people just, they fail. They don't get the instant recognition that they feel they deserve. And, and that's the thing. Nobody on YouTube, like in the beginning deserves to get, you know, millions of views. You got to work for it. You got to understand it first. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, people be in that dark phase and you just got to understand, you got to just keep staying consistent even if the audience isn't there, this is something I always say too. Um, when I first started, I knew I had no audience, but I still got on that mic and I talked like it was thousands of people sitting in a crowd listening to me. Like sometimes you just gotta make the video for the people that's gonna show up, not the ones that's not there. Mm. So like eventually they're gonna show up, you just gotta keep on, you know, implementing what works, doing the process. And if you get an extra hundred views on your next video, you know you're doing something right. 
and just double down on what worked, mm. right? As soon as you get that first viral video, like you need to double down on it. You need to make sure to end screen on every single video. Like that, that video is promoting every new video. And I'll break that down a little bit more because that's another way like the snowball effect works and the videos connect. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just so many things that you can do once you get that initial result to like keep on growing it from that moment. Mm. Yeah. You know what I'm curious about for you is like, like where was the dark, dark place in your, yeah. in your journey? What was the, the moment where you're putting out videos or you're doing something and it's just not really working yeah. as you expect. Yeah. And like, even the doubts are like kind of starting to creep in of like, yeah. is this going to work? Yeah. Like, what was that moment? The pivot. Um, a lot of times people on YouTube don't know how to pivot. It's, it's one of the hardest things to do, uh, especially in a gaming niche. Like if you're doing one game specifically, you can't just pop out and do another game. Like you're gonna, you're gonna pivot off a cliff. Like, so that was my dark moment. Like I had GTA content on a channel and it was going crazy. But then this Fortnite game came out and it was like, you know, that's looking a little sweeter. Like they get millions of views. We over here getting a couple hundred thousand. I'm trying to see what that's about. And I pivoted and I got good views. Like I had videos doing 100 k you know what I'm saying? A million, whatever. But it was never consistent. Like GTA videos was like, every video was just like consistently getting good viewership. Mm -hmm. Fortnite was like, okay, every once in a blue moon, it'll like pop off crazy. But that was like my dark moment. But that's when it kind of like forced me into that automation stage. Like, okay, now maybe I don't want to be in this position where if I ever need to pivot, I'm like risking my income, right? Mm -hmm. Let me put myself in a position to where it's not about me. It's not about my voice. It's not about the game I play, right? It's about only the viewer. Like stop making it about me. Stop getting upset that they're not watching these new videos because I want to try this new content style and just focus on what is working, right? And so that's what really pushed me to automate it because I have more, like I'm going from sneakers, right? Or I'm doing the sneakers, I have to show it on camera, do all that stuff, right? Now I got a little more freedom because I don't got to do all that on camera. Now I'm just focusing on gameplay and stuff. To completely removing myself out the process and it's like, okay, I have no emotional connection to the channel. I can do anything and nobody's going to know that it's me. And so that's where it kind of just like got me out of that dark spot where I was just like, man, like they not, they not really messing with me no more because I try to switch it up mm -hmm. and it didn't work. And so that was my dark moment. Um, and it, like I said, it just, every time I'm tested and every trial in my life, there's always a moment where I prevail through is because I just find out another route. Like I always tell people, I look at life from a different perspective, right? Like if you ever play pool with me, you'll see that I never take the direct shot to get a, the ball into the hole. I hit it off an angle or I'll do something weird and it'll still go in or something crazy. And that's just how I look at life. Like there's a different perspective in every single trial and tribulation that you go through. Mm. And so in that specific one, Instead of me saying, well, let me just revert back to what worked, I just said, nah, let me try this new business model out and completely take myself out the process. It's going to be a risk, but hey, it worked out. Mm -hmm. So that's just kind of like how I got out of that dark spot in my, in my time on YouTube. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I resonate with that, which is like, I think one of the things that we always look at is like pure talent, right? Like yeah. even, even in basketball, everyone will look at LeBron James, yeah. but it's just like, it's just a generational talent, yeah. uh, just incredible natural talent. And that's like one in a million, one in a billion even, yeah. that you're gonna be that good yeah. at something. Yeah. I think someone else, like no one really ever looks at, but like, even if you look at like a Patrick Beverly, yeah. and he has that determination where it's like, he didn't make the league, so he went to like Turkey, went, played in other countries, right. came back to the league. Right. And to be honest, you can do that in any endeavor. Yeah. Like if you just want it enough, yeah. you will find the path the to get path back to, get to the it, original yeah. place. Yeah. Him and LeBron both play in the NBA. Yeah. They're they both did. millionaires. Like right. they both have generational wealth. Right. Um, but he's like six foot and had none of the yeah. natural gifts that LeBron had. And I think it's a good. It's a good lesson. Like you yeah. can get there. Yeah. You have to push through. Yeah. And it's just, sometimes it's a different perspective. Like, yeah. Different routes. Everybody take different route. As long as the destination is the same. You know what I'm saying? Got to get there. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know where I want to go next? Cause I want to, uh, there's people that are listening to this and they're like, they want to start that channel and they want to yeah. do it in the right way. And I want to give them, I want to give them something so tangible to go away with. 
One of the things you mentioned a few times, like the niche. Yeah. The niche, the niche, the niche. Yeah. I think people have so many, it kind of stops them from getting started. Yeah. Cause they like, they don't know what they would even talk about. They don't right. know what people would find interesting about right. them. Right. Talk me through your thought process on the niche. So with the automation business model, the beautiful thing about faceless channels is the niche can be about anything. Some people can't do what I'm doing um, off the strength of just like choosing any niche and not knowing about it. Cause in the beginning, when you start this, you're primarily gonna be the person managing the team and managing the video ideas and stuff like that. Until you get to that point to where you can actually put somebody in place that can do it for you and be the person that has that brain behind the channel, right? But my process is really just doing that market research initially, seeing what niches are doing really well. And it's sometimes not the most like ideal niche because a lot of times people think YouTube automation niches are faceless gaming channels, NBA channels, soccer channels, top 10, um, sports, all, any time sports channel, luxury channel, crypto. Like those are like the basis of those niches. But like, for example, this year I'm doing a case study, right? From January 3rd to, you know, January 3rd, 2023, 2024. I got a channel that we started, we're spending $42 per video, right? In the beginning, we were posting like five to seven videos a month. Um, first month made $500. The next month it made like $5,000. And then the month after that is 7,000 back down to 5,000. And now it's averaging anywhere from five to $10,000 a month. And in a year so far, it's made like 70,000 bucks. But I don't know nothing about anime. Like, I don't know about, like, if you ask me what anime is, I'm going to tell you Dragon Ball Z and Avatar Last Air, but like, I don't know. But because the team I hired in the management company I have working that channel knows the channel so well, like, know the niche so well, they're able to do it and perfect it and post exactly what needs to be posted. So when it comes to choosing a niche, if you're the person that is going to be the brain behind the video ideas, you need to know the niche. Um, you need to have some type of liking to it. Like, if you like cars, right, if you like sports, you have to understand it, right? Because you can't just go out there and, and create a video that you think is gonna do well when you don't even know the NBA player's name, you don't understand. Cause like, what if there's a thumbnail where, I don't know, you have, um, there's this one video I always see popping up, NBA player sees baddies, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's like a, yeah, yeah. So it's like a, a, a picture, a thumbnail of, uh, Kylie Jenner sitting down and I think it's like Jordan Jordan Clarkson. Poole yeah, yeah, Jordan, Poole, Jordan, yeah, yeah. Poole. Jordan Poole looking at her and he's like he like you know, and it looks like you know he just saw her, right and so I see that and I'm like that video got like 10 million views guess what I'm gonna do I'm about to move Kylie Jenner I'm gonna put Kim Kardashian or I'm gonna put Tristan Thompson like, I'm gonna change the player up like I'm yeah. gonna make it look crazier right I might put LeBron James Kim Kardashian like I'm gonna do it like that and get that same result and so when it does come to choosing that niche you just have to really, number one, do your market research and really understand that niche if you're not going to be the one that is outsourcing the management piece. If you're outsourcing the management piece, then the person that's managing it, they really need to understand the topic and, you know, just the flow of it. Because you don't want to get a script writer that doesn't understand anything about the NBA, right? Mm -hmm. They have to know these things, right? Voiceover artists, they have to have that type of tone that you need, right? Video editor, they got to understand how to cut the video up in a way because if you ever watch the NBA YouTube automation video, the way that they do it, it's like a bunch of like open-ended questions, mm. right? So like they'll like start a clip, like in this next clip, we're going to show you LeBron James dunking on Steph Curry. That's just something I made up, right? But they have a clip playing of him playing against LeBron, uh, playing against Steph. But you see it and you're like, okay, you think that's the clip, but it's really just a retention hack. Like it's keeping you engaged until you see the clip. And so then it leads into that clip. It shows you the clip adds a little dialogue, a little effect, and instantly it's on to the next clip. But it's in a way to where it's like, it's emerging and it's like, oh, you just saw how he did this, but you won't believe what he did to this person. Like, and it just keeps going. And they have to understand how to edit like that. A lot of people don't understand that some video editors just don't have that type of, you know, editing down to even edit videos like that. You can't just hire anybody. So when it comes to choosing a niche, um, that it is really the niche that's super important, but the team that's gonna be creating videos with that niche that's even more important, mm. right? So just having that whole process down is what I feel like the niche is like super important, like just knowing how to run it. Yeah, you know what, let, let, let's go deeper into it. Right. So um, it starts with expertise, which is like someone yeah. on the team, preferably you, I guess yeah. when you're starting, yeah, really understands this topic. Right. However, so let's, let's use the basketball, like the NBA right. example. That's broad, right? Right. So like, 
within NBA on YouTube, you have like first take, mm. you have people that talk about like historical basketball right. stories, you have people playing 2K. Yeah. So like the 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 niche is broad, mm. but then like the angle right. that you take, which is yeah, like why people come to you. Yeah. What is that based off? It sounds like it's based off like the research, like the yeah. views. Like, yeah. So there's there's different types of uh, NBA channels, of course, like you said, NBA 2K, and but there's like the NBA, right? You can go NBA lifestyle where you're talking about things NBA players own and like the dramas and things that happens in their life, almost like a celebrity channel. Or you can go gameplay, like people like who are actually like showing clips of things that happen during the NBA game, right? And so that's just niching down, right? Figuring out what specific audience wants to watch what. Or you can go directly to a player, right? And primarily focus a channel around, if it was LeBron James, like all the videos just be about LeBron James, gameplay or lifestyle. And so when it comes to choosing that niche, when it comes to niching down from that broad aspect, you do wanna, you do wanna kinda start a little broad, but in a way to where you see like, okay, what's popping off? So if I start off broad and I'm like going into gameplay, but I'm kind of like focused on a lot of players, but I see that I did a LeBron James video where I focused on him and it went crazy. Now I'm like, okay, I'm doubling down on LeBron James. I'm just gonna stick to making videos about him and just keeping it niche down to that player. But it could be gameplay or it could be lifestyle, depending on what exactly the viewer watched and the video that did well to where we gonna basically niche down to like get to that. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a lot of ways you can niche down. Um, and they usually, usually they say to start off niching down, but I feel like my process is to start off a little broad just to see like what audience I can pick up and see what they really like and then kind of go deeper into like, you know, niching down once I figure out what the winning topic and the winning video is on the channel so far. Mm. Yeah. So you're doing, you're doing your market research to kind of understand what's popping off broadly in the market. Right. But then you're still doing like a, almost like an experimentation phase yeah. in the beginning where you're yeah. trying different shit. Yeah. And then the stuff that's getting more traction, you're doubling down on those. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Let, if we take that conversation a bit further, mm -hmm. I know one of the things, and we've even thought about it with, with my channel, yeah. is you'll see something pop off and you'll know, you're like, okay, I could just keep recreating videos that are similar yeah. to this. Yeah. But then I don't know if it's like ego or what, mm -hmm. but you're like, Man, you I didn't envision something. yourself yeah. as like, this, I just uh, talk about this. Yeah. And so you want to, like, you don't want to get like narrowed into yeah. like, I'm the LeBron James channel. Yeah. But then that's what's performing. Like, how do you even think about that? Like, how are you balancing? And that's the thing. Well, with YouTube automation, you're you're connected, but you're so disconnected. Mm. And so it's like, you're- It's based on performance. Yeah, like if that's what's working, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Like mm. just now when you're connected to the channel and you have that like, so like you're the sole person and you feel like you're doing the same type of video every time, you're going to feel that like, Ah, I just want to try something else. I just want to try something different. I don't want to keep doing the same stuff. I want to do things like this. But when it's automation, it's like, if it's working, just keep doing it. Like you don't have to, you don't have to. And I mean, if you really want to try something new and there's nothing wrong with doing that, it may work and do even better, right? But if you consistently get a lot of views on a specific topic and you're just almost like part one, part two, part three, part four, this one video that popped off, I mean, like I said, it, it it's just the algorithm working. YouTube's gonna keep on showing that next video on the homepage. And if you got a million views on that first video and they show your next video on that homepage, you're knowing at least a quarter of those people are gonna click on that video and give you your first 250,000 views just based off of how well the last video did. Mm -hmm. And it's just creating this snowball effect, right? So I feel like it's okay to do that, just to just keep on doubling down and remixing videos. Of course, there's gonna be opportunities where you can kind of pivot a little bit and switch it up and try something. But for the most part, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Like mm. just, just keep keep on doing it. But it is an ego thing. Yeah. It's definitely an ego thing. Cause yeah. I've seen it. Like even with me, when I was just doing my channel my, myself, like, man, like, bro, I'm doing this video and I know it's gonna blow up and I know it's gonna do well, but I wanna try something else. And then when I try something else, it don't work. And I'm like, ah, I'm gonna just go back to it. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah I know yeah. that feeling. No, I uh I feel it a lot. Cause like I remember someone broke it down and they're like, there's a difference between an artist and a creator, an artist just makes what they think is great art. So like they just create whatever they want. 
they don't even really look at the audience reaction. Right. A creator is making something for an audience. audience yeah. So like if the audience wants that, yeah. then you're taking that into account. Like you're yeah. making it for the audience. Um, no, that's good. You know what? I, I, um, I was watching a YouTube video. A guy was talking about like YouTube strategy and he spoke about the three T's. So he said the topic, the thumbnail, the title. I guess we kind of went into the, the topic. The thumbnail people, I know you spoke about it earlier, but people don't get how important, like changing, we, we actually had this in one of our videos, a video that's getting, that was at like a thousand views, change thumbnail and change title, hundreds of thousands, mm. completely different outcome. Can you talk about like, there's so much that goes into the thumbnail, but like, can you talk about the formula of just figuring out, because if you look at every channel, every big YouTuber, kind of have like a thumbnail format. Like it'll be different for each video, but like the, the foundation is the same. How do you kind of get to that template, that format? Yeah, so really what a thumbnail is, is a really good thumbnail has about three things going on in it. There's the main focus point, um, the color, like the color, the color uh, framework on a whole thumbnail. And then um, sometimes I don't like to use text on thumbnails. I personally don't like to, but th it does work for some people. Um, but maybe an arrow or a circle or a word or something, right? And so those are like the three focus points. So whatever that main thing is, whatever that uh, you know that color scheme is, and then the, the focus, the focal points with the with the arrow word or the circle. So that's kind of like the framework and formula that I use on a lot of these channels. It's just by having it like that because the thumbnail is telling a story. It has to convey a very clear story to the viewer. They have to be able to make out what it's saying, spark that curiosity, as I said before, and just really make them question like, yo, I got to click this video. Like, I remember Mr. B said, like, you got to have it to where somebody falling asleep about to go to bed is like, nah, I got to click this thumbnail before I fall asleep. Like, it has to be a burning desire to click it. And so just with those three things, like, you know, being able to convey a story through the thumbnail, that's why it's going to be, you know, like a killer video and just have people clicking through it because it's just those three main things. And that's typically what I like start with. Um, if I'm doing it myself or I'm hiring somebody to do it, it's just them having to know like, you know, what is going on in this thumbnail and just making it clear. It doesn't have to be a lot of stuff going on. A lot of times people put in a whole, like a whole sentence on their thumbnail. Um, the clarity isn't good. The color scheme is off. It's like really bad yellow text or really bad green text. Like it just has to be simple. And like the viewer has to be able to see it from all the different ways they see it. So you can see it on the homepage, right? You can see it on your phone. You can see it on a sub feed. You can see it on a suggested. Like, and there's thumbnail websites where you can literally go and place a thumbnail and it'll show you how it's gonna look on YouTube in every single area. And you gotta make sure your thumbnail it's so clear and it conveys a message so so perfectly that wherever they see it, guess what? They're gonna be able to depict what it's saying and see what it looks like and they're gonna wanna click it. Mm. So that's like my my process is the three those three things that I look at and then also just taking it to that website to see what it's gonna look like when it's on a platform so that I can kind of gauge how it's gonna get those views and everything. Yeah, you know what? I think the thumbnail is really one of those places where like what we said earlier is the case where if you just love the platform and you spend time on the platform, you're gonna be streaks ahead of everyone else because when it came to really taking the thumbnail seriously, it really started with me where like, I spent a lot of time on YouTube and I started just to analyze myself, like which videos am I clicking on? And then, because if you think about it on the homepage, there's what, like, I don't know, 16 videos yeah, that you see. Yeah, yeah. And there'll always be one that like kind of stands out that you're like, oh, I and need you just to click know that I need to click. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've never seen the creator in your life. You have yeah. no idea who this person is, but you're yeah. like, I've got to click that. Video. Yeah. Just analyzing like, wait, what did they do with colors? Like the text, the image, like even the little brightness and like the, there's so, there's so much depth. And it's really like actually studying like human psychology and like figuring out like what people pay attention to. Like people love numbers, for instance, so like, and specific numbers. So like all these little nuances. And it's like, if you love the platform and you're on YouTube already, you're gonna pick up on it so much faster than someone who doesn't like YouTube. And then that title too, that's like, that title has to add to that thumbnail. Mm -hmm. Almost like, 
give it an answer or, or, or a question, right? Um, Mr. Beast does this all the time. Like, he'll do a thumbnail. And I remember this one video, Train versus Pit. Um, just that simple title tells you exactly what that video is about. And now you're trying to see what's going to happen when this train goes into this pit, mm -hmm. right? Um, or I've been seeing a lot of these videos lately on YouTube. Um, they'll show a guy from, from zero to $10 million at the age of 20 or something crazy like that. And the title will clearly state like, 20 year old goes from zero to, to 10 million dollars um in one year or whatever it may be and then that adds to that thumbnail like it adds more to it right it builds upon that curiosity to make that viewer just click and go crazy yeah okay. yeah you know what let's let's talk about um you have the topic you have the thumbnail you have the title let's talk about the team aspect yeah because like and, and i understand this there's like um mm. There's a difficulty in like getting the right people in place and then like managing it. Yeah. And like whenever you're dealing with humans, the shit is just different yeah. like day to day. Yeah. Like you might think everything's good. Yeah. Next thing you know, that person steps out. They yeah. want to do something else now. The language barriers. Yeah. Some team members seeing you going crazy and they want to go and try and do it on their own. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's so many things. It's funny. I actually have a whole like book. Um, it's an ebook where all the freelancers I've ever worked with are in the book and like I give it to my students so that they don't have to go out there and try and figure out how to hire people on their own. They can just hire all the freelancers that I used um, to get, you know, my seven figure, eight figure wealth. And so it's funny that, you know, when it comes to the team, you just have to understand that you have to hire a team that knows what you're doing. They have to know the business model. You can't, like I said, you can't just go and hire a, a videographer um, somebody who is like shooting in real life and, you know, editing that way. You have to hire somebody that actually understands like the psychology of YouTube, mm. right? Um, and then communication, like that's so big, like having them all in a place to communicate so everybody knows. One of the best ways to keep a team organized with YouTube automation is a Trello board, right? And so on a Trello board, it has every single process in the, in the whole thing. You have the video idea, right? Video idea needs thumbnail. After that, you move it over to, um, you know, pending script. The script's done. You move it over to script complete. The voiceover artist sees script complete. They grab it. They move it over to voiceover pending. When it's done, and this is all in that little Trello stack. Like, you can see, you can hear the voiceover. You can read the script. Then they move it over to voiceover complete. Video editor sees that. Video editor grabs it. Video edit pending. They go ahead and they add all of these things to the video. And they edit the video and they make it. From there, video edit complete, ready for upload. And that's really just the whole process. Video, then it goes to video upload it. You start all over again. But when you have a team in there and they all collectively know like, okay, I need to do a script. I need a voiceover. I need to like, wait, they know their role. And then you have them in WhatsApp or Discord and we're all in a group where sometimes me, I feel like what kind of separated me from the crowd was, I'd get on Zoom calls with my like <laughs> my freelancers. Like I'd get on there and we all sit and talk like family. like and. Treat it like a real business, like, you know, give them raises, is to understand that they, you know, they have families and understand like what they're doing. Like I remember one of the things that I did for one of my freelancers, I had this video editor from the Philippines and um, his dream was to buy a home for his family. And because I was supplying him all this money to make these videos and I was giving him raises, and he was able to do that, right? And so really just understanding like the people that are working for you, they're not robots. They are actually people with lives and just really like, building that relationship with them. That's why it kind of separated me from that crowd because I'm getting on Zoom calls with these people, seeing them face to face on a day-to-day -day basis. Although I'm spending probably like four hours a week with them, um, they knew me and they knew like the content I was trying to do in this. So they really like working with me and stuff. Um, and so a lot of times people think it's just throwing them in the Trello board, throwing them in WhatsApp, giving them a video topic and then they make it happen. But it's like, no, like we, we, we a family, like we gotta do this and we gotta do this this correct way. Um, and just having longevity with them. A lot of times people don't, you know, they get a team, they hire a team, they hire freelancers, and they may get three, four videos out of them and then just completely fall out of communication because it's not working for them or they're, they're not getting the views that they want and they're just paying these people. But it's like, you're not pouring into people. You're not, you're not actually getting to know them, right? Every video editor I ever work with, I can text them right now and they go, like, oh my, like they're excited to talk to me because it's just like, it's a great work experience. Right. Um, and so that's just the thing when it comes to like just the team, like it's deeper than just hiring somebody who can do it, but hiring for longevity, like somebody that wants to go to distance with you, not somebody that's just ready to get you some quick views and then 
as soon as they get a better opportunity. Like I've had, I had tons of like other competitors try and take my freelancers, but because they love working for me and they love like, you know, the community and, you know, the environment of how I just make things happen, they'll still work for me and just do my work. Mm -hmm. And they won't take those better, like, you know, offers because they just know that just the way it is here, the communication is just amazing. And like, like I said, the atmosphere is good. So they just stick with it. Yeah. 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 So you, you go on this journey and it, and it starts with, you know, like making the first 5,000 yeah. and then you're able to leave your job and you're making like five to 10,000 a month. Right. And then you get to that first year when you make like seven figures off right. of automating the channel. I'm curious on like, a, on a personal level. Yeah. Like what's even happening in, in your life at that point? Because, and, and here's what I mean is there's like, there's also a burnout that comes yeah. with YouTube where like pe people don't get that mm. where, and I'm starting to feel it now where not only are you focus on content creation, yeah. you're then analyzing the results. Yeah. And so like, and then you're managing a team as well. Like yeah. you mentioned, like being on Zoom calls with editors, yeah. changing little things in the videos yeah. and like, just having that attention to detail. Yeah. And the other thing about YouTube is, is like, you can easily be forgotten. Yeah. Like you take a week off, two weeks off, they have some um, other NBA channel. Yeah, now. yeah, it's done. And so tell me about like kind of your energy levels. Like, yeah. what I was mean, that even like? It, it, it's a roller coaster. Um, it's, I mean, it's a roller coaster from the performance aspect. It's a roller coaster from like just balanced life in general. Um, because it just demanded so much of me like it just demanded like a lot um and so when i'm going through that and i'm trying to like you know focus on the business um my main my main thing was just always like trying to figure out ways that i can just de-stress and that way was always just like gaming like just getting on the game and just like if i sit on the game like it just kind of like trains my brain to just like relax and focus and like get my mind off of everything um i will say though that that burnout in that stage really happened early on when I was doing the content myself, not so much with the automation side because it didn't demand so much of me. Um, and so for the, for the most part, I truly never felt burnout with the automation side. It truly was just like in that, in that early stage. But when I'm doing it in that early stage, it's like, you know, you're doing videos every single day. You know what I'm saying this thing's going on. It's this place I gotta be that I can't be because I gotta sit there and do the video. Um, and so it get it get burned out real real quick. Um, but like I said, when you got a goal that you're trying to achieve and you just really set your mind on that goal and you just lasered in on it and you locked in, it's really like for me personally hard for me to allow the burnout to settle in. Um, because you know, like I said, I've been doing like these free classes every Sunday for the last year, and even that can be like a burnout too. But it's just like when you constantly getting a result, you, you impacting people and you seeing what's happening from it. It's like it's really hard to be selfish and just like a lot of burnout to get to you. But on YouTube in general, anybody that does it, you're going to get burnt out. Like you just, you're going to experience it. Um, and the best way to like overcome it is just really focusing on a goal. Like, what are you trying to do? Like before I'm done with this platform, I need a 10 million subscriber play. Like I need that diamond play button. I need it. Like I know how I'm going to get it. Like I already had a play. I know how I'm going to get it. Um, and so just off of that alone, I know I could never truly let the burnout take me out of what I'm trying to do. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know, the interesting thing and like, I'll even reflect on this sometimes is that yeah. the goalpost always moves, right? Yeah. So like when you're working at Macy's, you're just like, I want to do full-time YouTube. Yeah. Then you do full-time YouTube. You're like, I'm going to make a few other channels and prove that I can do what I did with this channel yeah. on other channels. Yeah. Then you do that. You're making yeah. seven figures. Yeah. Now it's like, oh, but I need the 10 million subscriber yeah. plaque. You think about like, like what's next? Like, is there a moment where you're just like, ah, like I'm kind of cool with what I, what I got? I mean, after the first seven figures, it was, but I just, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a trophy hunter, bro. Like even with video games, like I'm always trying to get the trophies and a lot, all the trophies. And so like, even like in my crib now, I just got all these YouTube plaques, all these click funnel awards, got a lot of other awards from other programs and stuff that I've been in. Um, and so I feel like after the 10 million subs, then I will probably feel that like, all right, I'm cool. Like, mm, I got, like yeah. you got it. You did it. Um, but for right now, it's just because 1 million to 10 million is so far and it's so apart, it's just like, bro, like I have to, I have to grind to that leap and get there. Um, but I feel like if that moment does ever come, it, it, it's going to be that. But, but I'm just hard on myself, like in general. Like I always say this, like I'm going to be a billionaire. Like I don't care what nobody says. 
I know I'm going to be a billionaire. Mm. I, I know exactly how I'm going to do it. I know what I need to do to become a billionaire. But it's like, but it's not because I, I want to be a billionaire because I just want that amount of money. I just want to be a billionaire because I want to be able to say like, yo, like I accomplished the highest of the highest. I got to the top of the top mm. and I didn't stop until I achieved it. Right. And so that's just how I feel about that 10 million subscriber play button. That's not a lot of people with that play with that diamond. So I got to the top of the top. I got there. I achieved it. And now like, I'm cool. So that's just like my mindset in general, just really just getting the most out of life that I can while I'm here yeah. and just leaving behind a legacy. The impact, yeah. the impact. Yeah. I'm curious for you, like, even when you think about it, that thought of like, I'm going to be a billionaire. Yeah. And I remember being very similar. Uh, and still am, to be honest. Yeah, but like very good. similar as a kid of just like, you just have this such a huge vision of like what you're going to achieve yeah. And you're so motivated. You're so sure it's going to happen. Yeah. Have you ever reflected on like why that even is? Like, why do you care about that? It's just, I don't, I'm just, I don't know. I just have so many things in this life I want to do. And they're so big. Mm. And it's like a lot of big things I want to do. And it's just, I don't ever cap myself. Like sky is truly the limit. Like I'm, I'm just never going to cap myself. And then when I ask myself why, like, you know, why am I still hustling and grinding and like trying to just keep going? I kind of feel like it comes from my, my upbringing. My dad just, I used to literally come into the home, like, you know what I'm saying, come from school. My dad's, you know, he's a CPA. So he'd be sitting at the computer and he's working, right? And then I'll go to bed and he's still working, right? Till like three, four in the morning. I wake up 6 a.m. He's still, like he's, he's getting, he go to sleep for a few hours and get up. And by the time I get up, he's downstairs working. And so I'm seeing that and I'm being trained, like, you know, to see that every single day. Mm -hmm. That's just like my mindset. Like he's sitting there working crazy hours a day to get to this, these goals. And, and it kind of just was instilled in me that way. And so I just can't see myself stopping. Like I can't see myself relaxing. Um, and I just, I just feel like if I ever do, I just feel like I need to be like doing something. Like that's just like my mind. I just can't. I can't until I get to this level, like, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, personally though, I just don't, I don't know if it's something that's in me that's like, maybe like something I'm trying to like prove, mm -hmm. but I just wanna be like, I wanna reach my full potential. Like I'm really chasing my full potential in life, like in everything. I wanna be 10 out of 10 with, you know, my relationship with God, 10 out of 10 with my fitness and health journey, 10 out of 10 with business, 10 out of 10 with relationships. Just like, that's just what I wanna do. Um, I'm just chasing my potential, like. Mm. That's really what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I remember um, having a conversation with my older brother and I literally said exactly the same thing. He like, he asked me what was the motivator. And I was like, I just want to chase my potential. Yeah. Like, I just want to see how far I can take it. Yeah. Because like a lot of the times when you start out doing something, you don't even know your potential. You're not even thinking, oh, I'm going to get a million subs or I'm going to yeah. make this amount of money. Yeah. But then it's like, it starts happening. You still, yeah. you're like, I just want to see how far it can yeah. go. Um, and I do sometimes think I'm like, will there be a point where I'm just like, it's enough no. though? Yeah. Um, cause like having that level of motivation, sometimes it's like, it's a tiring. And I question that too. Like even with billionaires I see now and just people that's in like the, you know, the industry and just like that are at that level. It's like, bro, like they still doing stuff. Like they still making music. They still in movies. They still you know, running with like, like Elon Musk still making new cars and like, like they, they not stopping. So it must be something that, or some type of reason why they're not, it's, it's bigger than the dollar amount. It's, it's bigger than that. Mm. It's truly an impact that they trying to have in this world. And so that's why I feel like, you know, when God put me on this planet, I feel like he gave me the power of social media and to like, you know, run it up crazy like that and also teach other people how to do the same. And so I just know that even at that level, um, I probably still will be going like even after the billion, like I'm valued at a billion dollars. I'm probably still going to just keep going. Um, but it's only because I see people that are at that level and it's still going. And I'm just like, I wonder why, you know, mm. so I, I never will truly know, but that's, that's definitely a question for a billionaire. I do have. Yeah. Yeah. No, nah, it's interesting. I think, I think the thing for me is I'm like, I just want to make sure it's like inspiration though. Yeah. Cause there's people that they're like, they're still out there because something's like not right yeah. internally. Yeah. And I'm like, if it's inspiration, like if it's like Elon Musk wanting to go to Mars or something, yeah. or like 
there's something that's like pulling him towards to do this thing. Yeah. And there's an impact. I'm like, oh, it's cool. Yeah. Like yeah, that's how I kind of rationalize it. Yeah. Facts. Yeah. Nah, this has been an awesome conversation, man. I'm yeah, glad nah, that we got nah. you on. Yeah, I love it. Nah, this is a cool setup. I'm, like I told you, I look at you want to start a podcast. Like <laughs> okay, before we get out of here, I had to give you guys one last gem. The sponsor of today's show, Free Agency. Free Agency helps you find and win top of market roles. Here's how they do it. They are your career quarterback. They provide you with a dedicated talent agent. They understand you and your career goals. They will find you interviews at top firms and make sure you secure a top of market salary. So if you're looking to take your career to the next level, free agency is the place for you. Go to the link in the description for more information.